Hey, Warners, this is your warning that the following episode of Women Your Mother Warned You About went a bit rogue from the beginning. You know, one of those episodes where we started the show before we started the show, you know, we were recording and then things happened. So put on your big girl panties and buck up for the ride with Rachel Pitts, Keith Walters and yours truly, Gina Tremarco. Guess we're as ready as we can be because it's a rogue show, right? So, hey, Warners, welcome to Women Your Mother Warned You About. I'm Gina Tremarco, sales trainer and consultant at Pivot 10 Results and founder of Carolina Improv Company. Happy New Year, Warners. Happy New Year, Rachel and Keith. Um, Rachel Pitts. I uh, am wifey, mommy, and a loan officer for U.S. Mortgage and super happy to be here. And Keith. Well, I'm Keith Walters, and I build great companies, and I am looking forward to doing this show, looking at all the different things that went on this year. What a year. What a year. What an awesome year. Uh, I think this episode is going to be like episode 53 or 54, so happy birthday to us. Very exciting. So this... um. This episode today, which is we're going to have fun doing it as we work our way through technology. Today we are doing a compilation. So we've each selected a show that was a favorite show of ours, which I had a ton of favorite shows, so that was really hard to pick one. And we're going to talk about our favorite shows, introduce some clips to those shows, and uh, we're going to wrap up with some cool rapid fire um, definitions of what is sexy from our previous guests. So that should be fun. So, so let's get started. Um, cool with you guys, unless you have any other reminiscing you want to do. <laughs> Rachel, Gina's really in a mood this morning, isn't she? What? Mm, I'm in a fine mood. No comment. <laughs> there Rachel's, you have it. Rachel's in a mood too. We're all in a mood. <laughs> <laughs> we're women this happens you know uh i'll get in moods like last night where i kind of wanted to like nuclear bomb the entire planet and then go off and hide in my little cave and watch game of thrones with my dog but merry christmas Did you do that? and happy new year <laughs> so it's a girl thing maybe i don't know do you guys get like that oh yes. keith does oh yeah didn't, I think we had this discussion in one of our episodes about yeah. you know guys going on their period occasionally too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> Keith told me a story yesterday that sounded like uh, he's ha he's got his modes, moods, moods and modes. <laughs> yeah, and his triggers. <laughs> and his triggers. Goddamn Ooh. triggers. Freaking triggers. Um, okay, great. So <laughs> why don't we get started uh, today's episode and every episode brought to you by Derma Vogue, um, keeping us pretty. I did see Dr. Turek this morning and he insists I do not need any touch-ups. You know, Rachel and I can get addicted to that stuff, but he insists I don't need to spend any more money. So that's good. So uh, let's talk about uh, the first the first the first clip we're going to introduce is one of my favorites. It's from episode seven with Anthony Inarino, author of Eat Their Lunch. Um, one of the reasons why I love this show so much was A, I loved him because he's got this weird Rachel, I think you remember, he's got this like weird sense of humor and it's like so dry, super funny, super smart, um, a little irreverent as well. And um, I chose a clip because I think this clip is applicable in life and business because it's the it's about the power. He called it the power, the superpower of caring, um, emotional intelligence and relationships. So this is episode seven with Anthony and Areno. Could you elaborate a little bit on that, on the caring thing? Because we're all touchy feely here at Women Your Mother Warned You About. Yeah, it's uh, it's something that I, I'm more and more being asked to, to to describe for people. And basically, what what I think has happened is that there's really just two business models left, and they're they're going in very very opposite directions. So one business model that comes out of Silicon Valley is everything needs to be technological. Everything needs to drive efficiency. You need to transact as fast and with as little friction as possible. 
And so you're seeing things like Amazon and you're seeing people try to re recreate that in every single market. How do I get rid of friction? And, and that's important and it's an interesting model. And Amazon is brilliant. They're the best at it. Uber's pretty good at it. There's a, there's a number of people and we're trying to do that in just every segment. How do we just transact? But at the same time, that, that's super transactional. There's also a model that's super relational. And super relational is don't get rid of the friction. Don't worry about efficiency. Worry about high trust, high value, high caring. Actually care deeply about what somebody's trying to do enough to spend time to understand their needs and invest in that relationship. And what I would tell you, my, my experience is that when everybody zigs, you should zag. And when everybody's trying to figure out how to take caring out and say, how do we compress everything to shorten it? How do we try to get all of the friction that comes with dealing with human beings out of the system? That's exactly where somebody who can deal with the friction and can apply caring wins. So caring is the superpower now, mm. unless you're transactional. I mean, if you're trying to compete with Amazon, I mean, forget everything I just said and try to figure out how to do that, even though they've got a really big head start. I mean, a really big head start. They're destroying whole industries because of what they do. Uh, and no one expected this kind of uh, success with that. But if you're not, if that's not your model, then you have to go the other direction. And I think everybody's getting pulled towards super transactional and they really should be moving towards super relational. Relationships are still going to matter. Why do you think people get so transactional or so focused on that versus relational? Because it, it, it allows them to have the belief that all I have to do is set up this marketing funnel, set up this Taylorism of uh, the sales process, slice everything into SDR, BDR, AE, AM, S, SME. You know, you've got eight people now because I can't let anybody have an expensive resource until they go through all these cheaper resources first. And what they're trying to do is just create an, an efficiency because it, when it's Amazon, it looks like printing money. And, and a lot of the startup companies now are trying to figure out how do you just print money without having to deal with the customer at some level. Mm. And, and there are models where that works brilliantly, but then for most of us, uh, if, if it's a service business specifically, if it's B2B and it's complex, I mean, all you do when you try to drive efficiency is reduce your effectiveness. And in human beings, fast is slow and slow is fast. So, so the faster you try to go in the relationship, the more you slow things down. And the slower you go, the faster things tend to happen because that's how trust is created. And, and caring is what allows people to take the next step with you. Can you tell us why you love that clip so much, Gina? I would love to, because it's all about, it's all about relationships versus transactions. Nobody wants to be transacted. People want to actually be cared for, cared about. People want to feel like you care. And people are going to buy from you and work with you if they're feeling that from you. And what I really liked was his, his quote, in human beings, fast is slow and slow is fast. The faster you try to go in the relationship, the more you slow things down. And the slower you go, the faster things tend to happen because that's how trust is created. I think that's pretty powerful because you really have to sit and think about it, the importance of how quickly we try to process people because we're busy and we don't have time and we're trying to like make everything happen quickly. And what we're really doing is slowing down and destroying and sometimes destroying the relationship. That's what I liked about it because I thought you could apply it both to real life and into business. What do you guys think? I think it's separating things and people because you use the example Amazon and Amazon's about things. It's not about people. Um, but you know, I think he's, I think he's got a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of value in what he's saying. Companies that have been able to bridge both of them have done really well. And I'll argue that Amazon has bridged both of them. Zappos has bridged both of them. Um, I, you know, Amazon is just a machine, but, um, about a month ago I ordered a gift for somebody and I transposed the street address and 
the I got a call from a driver about oh uh, and it left a message oh I can't deliver this there's no place here and so I look up on Amazon and I call customer service and this lady gets on and she just spends time with me making sure it's going to get to where it gets and then she's going to contact the driver and and the next day the package shows up at the right place and uh, I was I was impressed with the care that she put into making that happen, and so you know, especially with Amazon, who's transacting how many millions of transactions a day to spend time with me to get this little thing to where it needs to go. So that kind of impressed me. So this this I I love the idea, and then when somebody can hit both sides of it, you know. Well, I think what's interesting about Amazon is they acquired Zappos quite some yes. time ago, and so they inherited Zappos way of doing things because Zappos has always been customer focused, Mm -hmm. not transactional. And so I think it was kind of an interesting takeover. Um, And Tony Shea, the CEO, you know, said that the only way he would allow the takeover was if they could maintain their culture as it is at Zappos. But Amazon ended up benefiting from that to learn how to really give good customer service. Yeah. That's fascinating. I did not know that little tidbit, Gina. Mm -hmm. Um, And I definitely agree with what Keith's saying is there's, and and I'm speaking from my industry of real estate in general, that there's a lot of fear in the real estate industry that it's going to become automated transactional. And a lot of things are automated, especially in mortgage, things are so automated with systems and all. And There's so much human input that is so necessary. I spent hours on the phone yesterday holding people's hands through some things that, you know, the automated system put out and the numbers terrify them and something you just, you've got to have that human aspect, the relational aspect of a human being explaining to another human being how things work and like, Keith said, sometimes it's a small detail. It's a, the decimal was point was put in the wrong place and it screws everything up or the number was backwards and it, it sends things to a different place. And only humans with that intuition and and emotional intelligence can clear all that stuff up. So definitely thought Anthony was really on point on all of this with, um, both aspects of transactional and emotional intelligence being so important in all of the business. Um, and on that episode, following that clip, we got into a conversation about real estate and you guys, you guys talked about that, about the relational aspect of it. And then we went into a conversation about emotional intelligence and I'd asked him about that. And he started talking about empathy, empathy versus compassion. And he said something like, um, Empathy is a nice concept, but needs to be matched with an action of compassion, meaning you're willing to do something to help someone. Um, And he gave a great analogy of, you know, walking in someone's shoes, but recognizing that the shoes are two sizes too small and then saying, let's get you some new shoes, right? So it's taking, taking the action. And then he talked about emotional intelligence, IQ, and then MQ, because I'd never heard of MQ. Keith, have you heard of MQ? Like I'd... Yeah. The, the moral quotient of having mm-hmm. values. So you need that to be really high as well in, in order to develop those relationships. So there was a lot of great stuff in that episode, I thought. Um, yeah, we talk Jeff about wrote, moral quotient a little bit when we talk about core values because for a lot of company, you know, you don't need to put core values like honest, you know, that's like, that's state table stakes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so there's a certain moral quotient that's, that's required. Mm-hmm. That was cool. I learned something. I learned something new on that show. You know, one of the things also, you know, I said before is a product versus people. But now that I think about it, um, you know, maybe that separation is commodity versus something else. Because I think about some products like artisan products, like an artisan craft beer or craft mm-hmm. something. And people, you know, migrate to those a little bit because of the the relationship or the care that the the crafters put into the product and it's kind of that similar line of, yeah. of the care and the, you know, the caring for the person. Kind of the customization of it. Like training is a lot like that. When I, mm-hmm. you and I had talked about how I'm, how I'm scaling the business and it's, it's not about online. It's about creating a customized, a customized program for the client. Um, Jennifer Brown had talked about that and that, that connects to the client better because they don't feel like you're just handing them something off the shelf. 
Rachel, what did um what clip did you choose? I chose episode 20 with Zig Ziglar's son, Ooh. Tom Ziglar. And I was beside myself with excitement when we got yes, him on the were. show. I was just so I've been a Zig Ziglar fan for so long and um and his book, Choose to Win, just has so many wonderful nuggets, so highly recommend everybody grab that. I chose the clip about persistent consistency, and the reason I love this so much is because I, in my former life, I had a fitness business, and uh, I used to use these kinds of stories with my clients because they're so effective to get people to be consistent. And, and he talks about this um, block and a mailbox of how to consistently improve upon what you're trying to achieve. And I just thought it's a great, it's a great clip and it's a great way to um, work on fitness at this time of year in the new year when everybody's trying to remake themselves, but also in every other aspect of what you're trying to do in terms of goal setting. So okay, let's, a little let's bit of lead it. in on the clip and here we go. If you ever asked dad, uh, what's your number one reason for success? He would tell you character and integrity. And if you asked him, what's the number two reason? He would say PC. And he didn't mean political correctness. He meant persistent consistency. And so I, I was with dad and I really wanted to know the answer. I, I said, dad, what is PC? Even though I'd heard it a hundred times. And he said, son, PC is persistent consistency. Consistency is simply when you have a worthwhile goal or objective. And you work on it every single day or as often as necessary. And persistency is while you're working on it, you take it up a notch. You do a little bit extra. You go a little bit further. You, you add a tweak to it. You do something. And that's really how he built his career. If you look at the cornerstones of his career, it was honesty and integrity. And then it was that PC. And the perfect illustration for that is uh, when dad talked about losing his weight way back in the 70s. Uh, he went to the Cooper Aerobic Center. They checked him out. They said, you can jog. So he gets all the equipment. And the first day, he ran a block. And then the second day, he ran a block and a mailbox. And then the third day, a block and two mailboxes. And then, and then three mailboxes, then around the block, then two blocks. And so that's PC. Because he was running, he made a commitment to run at least five days a week. But every time he ran... He did a little bit more. He either went faster or he went farther. Now, there's a great sales application for this, too. Let's imagine that as part of your routine, you got to make 30 outbound calls a day, whether they're to cold calls or prospects. So the first day, you're going to do that five days a week. So you start doing it every day, 30 calls. That's consistency. But the first day you make your calls, the second day you tweak your intro just a little bit just to see maybe if you can get a little bit more engagement. The third day, you add a new question. The fourth day, you know, you maybe put in a little story or illustration, and you're constantly getting feedback for what, what persistency, what elevation can I give to my conversation? And when you do that, you build a career. Uh, it works in the service industry, works with your kids. It doesn't matter. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a principle that works everywhere. Well, what's so great about that is, and I'll use the fitness example because this time of year, that's what just about everybody's thinking about. And a lot of people will, um, they'll go join the gym and they'll be like, okay, I'm going to work out every day for three hours, five days a week. And then they crash and burn because they have done dick all through the whole holiday season. And then they can't maintain that level of consistency because it's biting off too much, like more than they can chew, so to speak. Um, and what Tom is expressing through his father Zig's story is start with what it start with something manageable and then add a little bit as with sales calls. And I was thinking if you're starting out at zero sales calls a day, 30 might be a little much. So, you know, start with five and then add six and add on and add on rather than, you know, try to conquer the world and fail at it. Just try to, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time. And I speak from experience because I tend to try to conquer the world often. It doesn't work always. <laughs> <laughs> 
there was a there was a book what I can't remember what it was called, but it was around that concept of like a one percent shift. If you do like a one percent shift every day, and you get consistent with that, then next yeah, thing you know. The uh, Darren Hardy's the compound effect. He talks about that. That's it. Um, that's the. Yeah, and that's he talks the about if you improve by one percent per day, then at some point you've improved by a thousand percent. Yeah. You know, compounds over time. That was my yeah. very. The compound effect was my very first personal development book I ever read. Oh really? I read it like once a year. It's the best. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't read it, but several people have talked about that that entire concept, which I think is a pretty. A pretty cool concept. I, as I was listening to that clip, I was thinking about what we've been doing um, in my business for shifting it, where I've been kind of stuck with doing all this online stuff, which I've decided not to do um, and to stick to instructor led training. But with every program, you know, there's we've got, I actually put together the whole menu yesterday for a client. There's like eight programs now, but with every time I deliver it, I add something new to it. And so it's become this really big, rich product because it just gets tweaked a little bit each time. A little better each time. It's true. And I think even like what you're just saying, Gina, even if you don't use the online stuff that you worked on, you were perfecting your concepts so that you yeah. they can translate into um, what you're doing live in person. And, and sometimes people, me included, will work on projects that end up not coming to fruition or I don't use it. However, yeah. the work put into perfecting this project, a lot of times that uh, the work and the learning that came from working on that project yeah. can be moved over into the next project, even if it's right. seemingly unrelated. Right. So it's never look at it as a waste of time if it didn't turn into something you were hoping you it was going to turn into. Ooh, and that applies to relationships too. A friend of mine, she's getting out of a bad relationship and um, we just keep telling her, you know, it's not a waste of your time. You had to go through what you yep. went through to become who you are. Sit, take me, exactly. for example. This is my third marriage and I'm just now getting it right. And I don't see any of my past marriages <laughs> as a waste of time because I had to learn how to act correctly and sometimes filter what the fucking shit that comes out of my mouth so <laughs> that I don't ruin this one. <laughs> and you know, what's, what's hard about that is you mm. don't recognize when you're in the middle of that challenge. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's totally. Yeah. It's easier to see it. It's easier to see it from the back end, but um, it's not easy to see it when you're in the middle of it. The back end always looks good. Really? So, well, most back ends do. <laughs> well, thank you, Rachel. Um, <laughs> Keith, do you have anything to add to to this PC? Oh, I love it. Um, Zig was a great guy. Uh, he used to work out at the downtown Y where I worked out uh, here in Dallas. Um, I remember seeing him speak years and years and years ago and then go into the Y and wow, there he is, <laughs> you know, and hang in the locker room. But uh, he was in great shape by then. And I remember that story about, uh, you know, about the mailbox, the block and, um, and it's really good, you know, and it applies to so many things. And, you know, in business, we set up these goals and, you know, we're at the, we're coming up on the beginning of a year. And so we're going to, you know, a lot of uh, businesses or people are going to set up these goals for the end of the year. Um, what do they want to accomplish? They're going to be stretchy goals. And I think, you know what, you know, Rachel, you pointing out the book about the compound effect, you know, set your goals big, but then back off and, and allow yourself time to run up to them. Consistent improvement from a very small start goes a lot further than, um, you know, just trying to jump into and get so much done at once. Um, that, that whole compound effect, whether it's 1% a day or 1% a week, you know, um, it's, it just, it just adds up. So I love that. I love that approach. Um, I, I used to, you know, I do, I, I was having lunch one time with a guy who's the first, uh, first person to climb, uh, first Canadian to summit Everest. And his name is Jamie Clark. And we were chatting about climbing Everest and, um, you know, he said he and his team got to base camp and, um, which is at 14,000 feet. And they're looking at the summit when they see it of Everest, which is 29,000 feet. And it's like, 
they look at it. That goal is so big. All they do is get back in their tent and go back to sleep. Um, and if they finally figured out how to get to the summit of Everest and the, and the way they got to the summit of Everest was by coiling the ropes and kind of, kind of goes right to Zig's, uh, um, and Tom's point there, because that was the next small step to do the big goals that we set. Once you set them, kind of forget about them. Think about what the little things are that can just the next step toward it, the next step toward it. Hey, Warners, this is Gina Tremarco. And if you know Rachel and I, you know how much we love our beauty strategies, especially Dermavogue, where we both go to keep our faces looking younger and healthier. Every time someone says to me, something looks different about your face, I can't help but to tell them that the Dermavogue team, led by Dr. James Turk, has been offering the Greater Myrtle Beach area the best in cosmetic and aesthetic dermatology since 2003. Dermavogue combines expert medical knowledge with cutting-edge technology, bringing their patients the most effective, flawless solutions to any skincare or cosmetic need. Some of the services to consider include Botox, skin peels, facials, bio tea, and much more. I personally love and highly recommend their Botox and lip injections for making my face look younger and healthier, and for bio tea for improving my energy, sleep, and weight control. At Dermavogue, they gauge you in the process of total body health to ensure your satisfaction with their comprehensive selection of the most up-to-date, non-invasive cosmetic dermatology and spa treatments. If you want to look and feel your best, Dermavogue can help you get there. Schedule your consultation today by calling 843-357-2444 or visit Dermavogue.com and tell them that the women your mother warned you about sent you. Keith, what uh, what episode did you choose? So I chose the episode that's, it's episode 35, I believe. And um, the title of it is Game Changers, um, a deep dive about something. Um, <laughs> I can't a, read the rest a, of the title on my on my phone that I pulled it up here, but I'll pull it, it was, up on my... It was a deep dive into the Game Changers book. Oh, that's what it was. Right, but I, I mean, how the, how the show started did not start based on the book. No, it did not start based upon the book. It started about exploding bee penises. Uh, and it was such an uncomfortable conversation. You're welcome. <laughs> that, um, yes, thanks to Rachel. <laughs> Do we have that, do we uh, have that do we have that clip ready to go? We have that clip ready to go. This was one of those rogue episodes. Every and... episode with the three of us is rogue, by the way. <laughs> so it's it's uh um and uh for you men out there that are listening to this, just oh, and if you haven't heard this episode, just you know you know, grab hold of something. <laughs> Not your penis, but something. Hey, don't well, tell them what to do. To, to say. <laughs> <laughs> Grab whatever. Okay. Oh gosh, God, we're gonna have political issues. Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay, here, here's here's the episode. <laughs> so bees' penises explode. Okay, so the the po- Facebook post I saw was a friend of mine that said when ha- when male honeybees mate, their penises explode and they die. <laughs> and I was like, is, and I t- posted, is this really true? So she sent me a full article on this. So it's like bee porn, really, because the description of this crazy thing, it's, you know, all these bees that go crazy when they find out there's a, um, a virgin queen around. So... Hold on. Let's just get to the good part. Oh, I thought <laughs> I thought being part. a virgin was the good part. Oh, it not for the queen. Well, she's got like literally upwards of, you know, thousands of male bee drone prospects. Oh, I know how her. that goes. I feel so I feel bee, for her. The male bee, he All right, let's just read the whole thing. He 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 has actual claspers on the end of his penis to grip the queen, to grip on her. And then he enters and he's trying desperately to ejaculate into her sting chamber. Wait, 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 wait. Bees ejaculate. Listen up, Gina. As the penis is 
everted, which it only shows up when he's in heat, the drone becomes paralyzed and does a backflip. You can't make this shit up as he ejaculates. The ejaculate, drone ejaculation is so damn powerful, the semen blast possesses such force that it's actually audible to the human ear. Apparently, it sounds like a pop. This little exchange also explodes the penis entirely, or rather, it ruptures it from the drone's body, allowing it to remain inside the queen's vagina. But fret not. This mating sign... <laughs> fret not, Keith. And men listening. <laughs> fret not. This mating not. sign does prevent further penetration from other drones. Oh, it does... It does prevent other penetration from other drones, rather just the prevention of semen loss. There we go. And, and, and of course, you can imagine the drone bee dies after that. So, <laughs> is it a, what I guess the moral the dr- of the is story the is, the aren't you glad you're not a bee? Is the drone the male? Guy? Yeah, the male. So the drone... The queen is So the, the drone yeah. ejaculates with his claspers and then he dies. After his penis explodes. <laughs> well, yeah, after the backflip and the penis explodes. I mean, I can, well, I can handle insects. a backflip, but the penis thing is... Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I, that's I, even want, worse. I want a man who's going to do a backflip after he ejaculates. <laughs> Don't they that all? would be funny to well, watch. Well, I think there's, it's, there's some interesting um, situations in, in uh, nature where I think the praying mantis, she eats the male after they consummate. Is what I think happens. That's correct. So why would a man? Yep. Wh- why would a man, um, of that species? What did you? What is that, the praying mantis? Why would a male praying mantis ever get involved? I think they he's don't that, know that, that's he's that stupid and horny that he's going to do it. Well, it's instinctual, and I think he doesn't. He doesn't know realize that. he's going to die. I don't think they stupid talk about guys. That. They don't talk. Yeah. yeah, keep it to themselves. Man, I'm so glad that I brought that to the table. My my mother would be proud. <laughs> Actually, she would not be surprised. Anyone who really knows me knows that so he, that's one of my favorite subjects. So, so he, I don't, I don't why know. Did, if, why did why did you choose this one? <laughs> <laughs> it was just, I, it was so because, memorable. Of all the episodes we've done and I've listened to, this one is so memorable, and I it, it's so uncomfortable for me. <laughs> <laughs> but what I thought, what I thought here, and I don't know if the video of this show, the one we're doing right now, is going to post or not. But if it is, watch it. It is so funny to see both Gina and Rachel with their head in their hands. <laughs> <laughs> I could say so much about head and hands. Sorry, I, I mean, if we're <laughs> going to talk about B sex, uh... oh my god. <laughs> Oh gosh, people! But this one was just—I don't know. It just—it's. I think one of the things I liked about it was it kind of goes to this show, which is raw and irreverent and fun. And um, you know, we talk a lot about different um, business aspects and some things that are tough. And we've had some guests on where we cried, and um, but you know, just having fun. And this one is just a, a great. Very, for me, very memorable because it is also very uncomfortable from a physical, like, oh, uh, as a guy to, like, have this knowledge. <laughs> and and d- it does go on to make some really – we do have a really great discussion because yes. Game Changers by Dave Asprey is one of all of our favorite yes. books. Like, I just yesterday yeah. gave that – uh, book title to my physical therapist and was like, you've got to listen to this on your drive home. Like it's the best book ever. It really is. So and I hadn't maybe read Dave it. Asprey will be on our, on our um, show soon. You haven't read no, it No, I hadn't read it when we did that show. Oh, and so right. I got it and I read it mm-hmm. and man, I love the book and it's very similar to, to something else. Another person that I follow as well. And I love all the, the bio hacks in it. So it was a great intro to that, um, to that discussion <laughs> of that book. <laughs> Somehow it tied in. I don't really know how, but who cares? Well, you know, the the best part of that intro was getting back to the show and the concept of the show. And, um, you know, we're one year in and we're getting ready to start a second season is that whole thing came from just banter. That whole clip that everybody just heard was banter before we actually started doing the show. Yeah. So it was just a conversation that led to 
Game Changers because it reminded Rachel and I of the things that are discussed in Game Changers. And so that's another great example of creativity, collaboration, creating new stuff together just from like free flowing, which is what a lot of our rogue shows do. I mean, I definitely got a good education about B sex. That's but it's also it's also that you know you just mentioned the the collaboration and just the creativity and collaboration, and that's one of the fun things that happens in in business and in life when you can kind of go a little bit off script and just see what happens and allow people to turn loose a little bit, um, as opposed to some real structured formal approach where where people aren't able to speak their mind. Yeah, and I think what, what what happened because of that that show in particular is that we then decided when the three of us are together we will just go to start recording. Maybe we'll have a yeah, just start recording, and maybe we'll have a topic. Yeah, we missed some good nuggets before we started recording this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Little recap of my visit to the Museum of Sex on twenty seventh and seventh in New York City. Be sure to put it on your calendar. <laughs> Well, that's, that's Rachel's going to take up a new job I'm, as a since, docent there, by the way. So, with <laughs> a sex docent, I like. It. Hey, you never know with me. You never know. Do you want to give us one morsel of that? Since I, I missed it while I was dealing with a microphone issue. Sure, I would be happy to. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we're talking about sex now, and and getting we're getting ready to wrap up the show. What better way to wrap up the show than a happy ending? What, right, totally. Well, um, <laughs> we had walked by the Museum of Sex uh, in New York City a few years ago when we had the children with us, and we're like, oh, look at that. Maybe we'll go someday. And so on our trip to New York last weekend, we put it on our list, and it was actually interesting. The the first exhibit that was there was about the history of porn on film. So my big takeaway there is that it doesn't matter what time period you are filming people doing the deed. It's pretty much the same. It happens the same. There's sometimes more hair or less hair. Um, <laughs> and so it actually was very interesting, you know. And then the upstairs exhibit was a very fascinating um, timeline of the pro progression of transgender basically and uh, started kind of in the fifties or maybe even earlier of the drag, you know, drag clubs and all of that kind of scene and how it was really hidden. And actually they had this little program that it was the PTA and it was like talking about the moms in this classroom and the moms in that classroom and how it was actually code for this is where we're meeting for the, the thing, you know? Um, and uh, then it progressed through, you know, photographs of beautiful photographs of same sex marriage and, you know, drag queens and, and how the world has come to accept more readily that that choice of lifestyle. And um, and also just after that episode we had recently talking about acceptance um, with who was it, Gina? Uh, Brown. Oh, uh, Je Renee oh yeah, Brown. Gen uh, Jennifer Brown. Re Jennifer Brown. Jennifer Brown. Brown. Thank you. Um, talking about acceptance and just walking around New York City and seeing same sex couples walking around holding hands, which, you know, a few short years ago probably wasn't as easy for them as they just were naturally doing so in New York. It's really. Well, amazing. you know, when and you don't see that so, a lot in Myrtle Beach, do you? Uh, no, not at all. It hasn't trickled down that far yet. Um, the, the irony is this episode is actually airing. Um, on, on a day that I'm in New York, seeing Jennifer Brown. How cool is that? Oh, awesome. <laughs> Sweet. Well, y'all should well, go to the sex museum then. Now I'm, now, yeah. <laughs> There's a sex shop downstairs, oh, incidentally. I need, I, need, I need some toys. <laughs> Don't we all? By, by the way, Keith, that's on my Christmas list. Oh, Christmas is coming gone. They had a candy cane shaped one. I, we were kind of looking at that one. I'll remember that. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, wow. There's a whole topic. Did we add that to our what topic, topic list? What topic are we? Sex shops? Sex shops or candy cane shaped or, sex toys? Or sex toys in general? Keith is always going to take us there. Um Check, check, check. All right. So. Oh, that's oh what gosh. she said. Um, we have, um, before we wrap up the show, we're going to um, hear a whole bunch of, um, from our previous guests, their definition of sexy. So let's take a listen to that. 
since this podcast is the podcast that makes everything sexy again, how do you, Maureen, define the word sexy? Confidence. It is standing in front of that mirror and looking for all the good. Sexy is somebody who owns who they are and portrays it magnetically. It doesn't have to be beauty. It just it's somebody radiating the essence of the beauty of who they are. It doesn't it doesn't have to do with how beautiful you are or, um, you know, it's just sexy is owning who you are. To me, that's sexy. How do you define the word sexy? I was I had a nice little body in my 20s and I felt like a loser. And it wasn't probably till my 30s or 40s when, I mean, let's be honest, I've had babies and everything sags and is lumpy. But it, now that I have some confidence, I feel sexy. I think it's about power. <laughs> That's a, I, I would hope most women would answer that that way. I, I, bet, I would bet men would not answer that that way. I think for us, power is sexy because we don't have it often. So to have it, to exhibit it, to embody it internally, I know that when I'm speaking with authority and I'm I'm coming from this deeply embodied authentic place that is the most powerful and therefore you know I think the most sexy I ever am I define it as ownership of who you are once you are fully in your power and your authentic self it is just so fucking sexy to look at <laughs> you know like yeah how do you define the word sexy? Like what's sexy to you aside from strategy, which we already know? Well, I think power is sexy and that has always been um, true for me. And I think I make this mistake with men because I get attracted to narcissists because I think, because they think they're powerful. So you got to find real power. <laughs> and I, I find power very sexy. And so to me, what is power? Power is having control of your own self. Power is being an influencer in a positive way and encouraging people around you to be successful and to achieve their goals. That to me is power and that is so sexy. I love watching people build the people around them and to sort of influence in a positive way. I, you'll probably think I'm crazy, but Obama was so sexy in that way that he could bring all the people around him into the most positive discussions, the most positive light. That, that's sexy. All right, those were fun. <laughs> um, I think, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, no, you go. Go ahead. No, I was going to say we need to get some schedule, some pod, some rogue podcasts and other podcasts. Yes, scheduled we're going to first wrap this show up, and then I'll talk about that. <laughs> Stay with us. Oh, Stay with I'm us. sorry, I'm working ahead here. Uh, my compounding is compounding faster. That's than why men need women. We keep you on track. <laughs> keep Whoa. forgetting to the ending. Oh, the ending. I, you know, I'm not right. really, that's okay. okay. Men usually pay very close attention to the ending. That's actually is a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> if you can lose that goal orientation, then you can just, Oh yeah. Right. You can have just a totally different experience. <laughs> Help. <gasps> okay. Gina, <laughs> continue. <laughs> All right, Warners. That was our 2019 wrap up show, our first our first season. Um, again, Happy New Year. Thanks to all of our Warners for listening to this episode and all of our episodes in 2019. Uh, we're excited going into uh, 2020 and uh, to our sponsor, Derma Vogue, for um, helping us bring this show to you. To connect with me directly uh, or learn more about what our company does, you can find that information on our website, womenyourmotherwarnshipout.com, or go directly to pivot10results.com. And Rachel? To connect with me, Rachel Pitts, you can find me all over social media as Rachel on Real Estate or find me directly at rachelmtg.com and find all our social media le links and free downloads on our website at womenyourmotherwarnedyouabout.com. And Keith? Well, you can find me on that website, womenyourmotherwarnedyouabout.com. Just go to About Us and you'll find a link to my LinkedIn, the easiest way to connect with me. <sighs> Anything else you want to share with us, Keith, before we go? 
No, apparently I've shared too much as it is. <laughs> All right, Warners. And if you haven't given us a review already, please do so uh, on, on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And um, to keep your business sexy, keep things real, raw, and relevant. And a little irreverence doesn't hurt either. Bye, everybody. Bye, Gina. Bye, Rachel. This really will get serious soon. Yeah, don't. It doesn't have to. I don't think anybody wants it to be serious.